also extend my warmest welcome to participants from all corners of the world. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. It is my great pleasure to be here and to welcome you all at the opening ceremony of the 21st International Congress of Aesthetics with the theme Possible world, Worlds of Contemporary Aesthetics. Aesthetics between history, geography and media. This Congress is organized by University of Belgrade, Faculty of Architecture and the Society of Aesthetics of Architecture and Visual Arts of Serbia under the auspices of the International Association of Aesthetics. The conference was supported by Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia, in collaboration with Gete Institute in Belgrade, as well as Sintidon University, Faculty of Media and Communications. We are proud to announce that we received over 500 submissions from 56 countries, which make this conference the greatest gathering of aestheticians in this region in the last 40 years. We are now opening this ceremony with a welcome remarks about, by our respected professor and the Dean of Faculty of Architecture of the University of Belgrade, Vladan Jokic. Dear Professor, would you please join me for welcoming our respected guests? It is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture. Uh, our school is very proud to host you this week here in Belgrade in the Faculty of Architecture and I hope that you will have a great and successful conference. Faculty of Architecture has a long tradition of teaching architecture in our country. Uh, last year we celebrated 170 years uh, from the beginning of the high education in terms of architecture in Serbia. And in this, in this long tradition, we are now very focused on the international cooperation. In the past 10 years, we organized a lot of conferences, workshops, uh, guest lectures. We uh, made agreements with many schools of architecture in, uh, in Europe and abroad in, in all over the world. So we are very, very uh, uh, very focused on the, this international cooperation, and I hope that this conference is also in, in that track and is going to, to help us to uh, somehow achieve uh, a great, a great achievement in the uh, in, in this week. Uh, so, as, as, as it was said a uh, few few minutes ago, uh, there is a big interest for this conference, more than 500 entries from more than 50 countries, so I think it's a good spirit for the beginning, and I think there are more than 350 people registered here, and uh, I hope that this is going to be very productive uh, in the next uh, few days in our school here and in our building of the Faculty of Architecture. So, uh, I wish you a very pleasant stay in Belgrade, I wish you a very successful conference, and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for your message. Now we are going to greet our respected Professor Vladimir Makov, the President of Society of Aesthetics of Architectural and Visual Arts of Serbia. Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure really to uh, welcome you on behalf of the Serbian National Society. Uh, we have been very happy when we got this uh, conference to organize. And trust me, we will have the second time our happiness on the table when we finish it. So in five days. Uh, but uh, I hope that this will be a very beneficial conference. Uh, as you heard, we have lots of speakers. Uh, some of them are new, some of them are experienced, and I think that is the point of this conference, to pass the experience to the new generations. Uh, I must uh, admit that we wouldn't be so organized that we don't have our beautiful students that we met already, and they are really very happy to help us uh, because 
they are, they, they are thirsty for having links with the world. So that is also beneficial for them. Have a good time and have a very beneficial work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your speech. Now we are going to give the floor to respected Professor Jale Edson, President of the International Association for Aesthetics from 2016 to 2019.
Christina Riposella, who organized the International Conference in, 19, uh, in 2013. And uh, second vice president, uh, Professor Joseph Men, Men, who organized the conference in 2016. Then, of course, Zoltan Somhekyi, who is the second time the elected secretary general. <laughs> and I thank him for all the help he has given me and he has given to IAA during these three years. He's a very hard working man. <laughs> and uh, he may be uh, he may be giving a lot of work also <laughs> to the officers. The um, Vice Secretary General Polona Tratnik from Slovenia. I don't see her. her <laughs> Slovenian Society of Aesthetics, 
and an individual writer about arts and similar things. So I speak from the different points, and I believe in this plurality in this moment. But, what's the beginning? We are living in turbulent and danger times on global level. We are living in time when humanistic studies and aesthetics, art, history, culture studies are pushed on margin in the time of dominance of skill education. I believe that this Congress and our society supporting the idea of fundamental research in humanistic studies, in aesthetics, in studying of art, culture, media, and of course something what is most important in this moment, nature. And I believe that our work in few days will help us to see this world on another day. And then I want to, take, to give thanks. Thanks to the Dean of Faculty of Architecture, Professor Vladan Djokic, for great support in every moment and every second of our work. Thanks to the Professor Mako and his fantastic young team of scholars, students, who supported and worked in preparing this Congress and gave us real energy. We got energy from the Jale Erza and from the young scholars. And I want to thank the Ministry of the Science and Education in Serbia who gave support to this. I want to give thanks to the Faculty of Media and Communication, which I represent in some way my fourth or fifth identity. And I also want to thanks to the Gate Institute in Belgrade supporting our exhibition, Muse National Museum from Belgrade to support this exhibition, and Museum of Contemporary Art from Zagreb, Croatia, who also supported this exhibition. Thanks to all of you who come in Belgrade and make these five days days of aesthetics and instead of better world. I believe in better world in any case. Thank you. Thank the Dean Vladan Djokic, Professors Vladimir Marko and Jale Erzen, and President Mishko Shovakovic on the warm world, world of welcome. With this, opening ceremony is finished, and now we move on the working part of Congress. Once again, I would like to welcome Jale Erzen on the stage, who will in the next 45 minutes give a presidential lecture with the name Buildings Speak to Us. Jale Erzen is a painter and art historian. Since 1974, she has been teaching design, art, and aesthetics courses at the Faculty of Architecture at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. She was editor of the Guayo and the Dimensions Fine Arts Journals from 1980 to 1984. She is a recipient of the French Ministry of Culture, Art, and Letters Chevalier Honor, as well as recipient of contribution of Turkish Architecture Prize in 2008. Jale Erzen was a general secretary in, of the International Association of Aesthetics from 1995 to 1998, vice president of the International Association of Aesthetics from 2010 to 2016, organizer of the 17th uh, International Congress of Aesthetics in 2007, editor of two preceding books of the Congress, and editor of the International Association for Aesthetics Yearbook from 2003 and 2008. Professor Erzin, Erzin was the president of the Turkish Sanat Association of Aesthetics and Visual Culture from 1991 to 2010. She has many books and international publications on art, architecture and aesthetics. Finally, she was president of the International Association for Aesthetics from 2016 to 2019. Professor Erzin, the stage is yours. Thank you.
also feeling that there is a lot that is problematic about architecture today, that I would be speaking, that my talk would be one of the few talks about architecture. Well, to my surprise, to my very pleasant surprise, <coughs> when I looked over the program, <coughs> I saw that there are really, this time, a lot of presentations about architecture, which is wonderful news for aesthetics and wonderful news for architecture. I would like to approach the state of architecture, <clears throat> its condition as an aesthetic environment, and our relation to it, as I dwell on its multiple assets that are constructed of the city atmosphere, I am constantly reminded of how the most telling feature of today's architecture is often its imposing physicality, while all along history, each minute form, from a cornice to a balustrade, from the curvature of stairs to the frames of windows, the heights of ceilings, the position of doors, etc., were studied and calculated endless times before acquiring their final form. According to the International Association of Aesthetics Constitution, I quote, aesthetic embraces all studies of the creation and appreciation of the arts, of the aesthetic values of art and nature, of industry and everyday life, and of the relations of those activities and values to, to economic, political, and social life and other modes of human culture. Applied to the study of architecture and urban design and to the critical appreciation of these aesthetics, of these aesthetics becomes a must for architectural education, which today is increasingly a multidisciplinary pursuit. All aesthetic considerations have to be understood and implemented by architects and urban designers in their designs because <clears throat> social relations are conditioned by the settings in which they take place. Mishko Suakovic defines architectural practice as one that, I quote, transforms the contingency of nature into the planning of living space and the infrastructure of the human world. As our essential living means, architecture can be regarded from many viewpoints, aesthetic, practical, political, economic, etc. Let us view the meaning of the architectural body and how it speaks to us. Architecture conditions our most intimate and at the same time common aesthetic experience, such as the urban, creating vocabularies and languages that can offer openness or isolation and negativity. As with most everyday objects, we are often not attentive, attentive to its special attributes, but they work on our psyche unawares and assume human value. They are the basic stimulant of our daily aesthetic judgments and experiences. Architecture is the one and only art we cannot do without. It conditions the atmosphere of our exterior urban spaces, in fact, forming the interiority of urban spaces. In the <coughs> words of Aldo Rossi, as the, I quote, as the creation inseparable from civilized life and the society in which it is manifested, 
by nature, it is collective. As the shape giver of our shelter, it surrounds us like a second skin within which we can retreat to our own interiority. Thus, architectural bodies, buildings, are the primary constituents of our worldly and individual orientation and of our feeling at home in the world. Buildings are always experienced with meanings they suggest because as a linguistic animal, we always understand objects through the language of their forms. Architecture and the city are constructed language. <clears throat> Ar architecture creating the city and our personal habitat offers the basic sensual stimulants that connect us to the world and to ourselves. In the urban environment, architectural bodies affect our psychology and sense of social belonging or can be instruments of discord. In our increasingly polarized world, ideologies are using modernist forms or religious symbols in architecture or urban designs as oppressive, resistant, or concordant forces. <clears throat> Yet, if not made a tool for animosity, the diversities possible in urban context in urban context <clears throat> are the means for opening and understanding. Robert Venturi, through his book, Learning from Las Vegas, was to show that popular forms can offer both the high and the low. Both ideologies, the artistic, the critical, and the populist, try to build their societies through architecture. The building of a religious structure does not only concern architecture, or it doesn't only concern religion. It is creating a society through charity, engineering, land speculation, collecting, consecrating, and symbolism. However, a religious building that has meaningful and inviting forms can give spiritual light also to those who are not religious. Likewise, artistic or critical forms have meanings that aim to bring together not only like-minded people, but to create awareness beyond conformity. The architectural body. Paul Crowther uses the term the body of architecture as, I quote, the medium's distinctive physicality and the human body's engagement with it. I use the term building as body in a literal sense, suggesting that architecture is experienced almost as our own bodies and of the inner space of our bodies that we feel but can only enter mentally. The inside and the outside are two dialectical positions and relate to the inner world and to the other. The building is an archetype of the body and like all bodies, its appearance has a distinct meaning, a specific language. However, as the human body, it is most valuable when we are not made 
to feel its mater materiality. As Georges Bataille said, architecture is what is left after structure. In other words, it is the symbolic and spiritual value that makes the essence of architecture. A window is there for us to see outside, to get light and air. We don't need the window, we need the light, the air. We don't need the chair we sit on, we need to sit. If the forms are beautiful and attract us to their physicality, again, beauty carries us beyond the material to a spiritual world. This is how one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, Louis Kahn, Louis Kahn talked about architecture. In this sense, I find the relation between the body of architecture and the human body to be very indicative. We do not want to be reminded of our body. When we walk, we should not feel our legs, but rather the energy and the force against gravity. Our spirit wants to forget the body. It is when we are attracted by the aura and presence of spaces that architecture becomes valuable and unique and transcends its Each building in a city talks to us according to its shape, its color, its position, and its physical relationship with people and place. It can be frightening, chaotic, and make us feel insecure. We can, <clears throat> can be mute, cold, and without expression, can be intimate and joyful, it can be aggressive, it can be confusing because we do not know where the entrance or the exit is, can be too self-conscious, it can want to be something else than what it could be, like an apartment house trying to become a Swiss chalet. It can be defensive with walls and railings around it, as many government buildings in Ankara are today. It can be distorted because its function has been changed without appropriate change in its appearance. It can seem awkward and out of place where it is. It can look old and weak and make us feel uncomfortable not knowing how to act in front of it or in it. Or it can have a presence that can bind us to itself with its proud form. <clears throat> That's in Italy. Unawares, our relationship with the world and with the cosmos is suggested in the meanings that arise in our relationship with the buildings and with the city even merely as shelter. Architecture relates to differentiating human existence from the rest of nature. A building has in store more po poignant and varied perceptual experiences than a place in nature would have. According to Heidegger, what is hidden in nature is revealed in art. It is through architecture that we can abstract or isolate sensual <coughs> qualities as singular values and enjoy their many phases according to how they enter our space, creating a silent language. Architecture tells us what society and its civil condition is. It expresses the soul of society and is consequently a sign of transcendent reality 
as well as of the state of civilization in a culture. But this also means that it is a sign of power that we meet in our culture. I mean power in both its positive and negative sense. Imagine how proud is a man who builds his own house and gathers his family in it. And Albert van der Schut is here, the architect of this house, of this house who will speak about this building in the, during the conference. That is why the natural model for architecture is labor. Architecture is not only a symbolic art, but it is a tragic art, which leaves the language of most humanity generally unheard or heard without an objective basis. Because so many people, so many people of the world live in places that cannot be called architecture. Thus, as Bataille claims, Architecture is society's authorized superego. It speaks to multitudes or silences them. It is also tragic because it holds on to memories. The show of power through architecture or urban forms, creating ostentatious spectacles, mesmerizes the masses. Goethe said that the sacred is what connects souls. According to him, the sacred is when the end and the means to attain it are one and the same thing. Good architecture that achieves this retains and radiates the social soul. Ideally, this soul is present in the urban reality as institutions, monuments, memories connect people who are strangers but who assume kinship by being in the same place, by using common institutions. Each institution is the ultimate development and realization of one of our senses and through this articulation becomes a socializing factor. Music is the development of the auditory sense and the musical brings together, <coughs> brings people together about their intimate sensory pleasure. Thus, architecture, architectural bodies representing institutions create the discourse <clears throat> continuing in history and of the diverse aspirations and resistances of multiple communities that create the city. It is the use and discourse of the community of strangers who come together in architectural spaces that give shape to the city and creates silent interactions through shapes and symbols. <coughs> Therefore, architecture of buildings and of cities, when they cater to the society, can create bonding situations, alienation, despair, and animosity begin to happen in many cities where only the separating forces of racism or capital are at play. As Levi Strauss has so suddenly expressed in Tristropy, once people begin to feel threatened besieged in their geographical, 
social and mental habitats. They fall into the danger of finding the solution in considering a part of human species as not belonging to humanity. Art created critically with knowledge and labor can be the means to build a sincere human habitat. Therefore, aesthetics in architectural education with a view to philosophical discourses concerning the human habitat and the concern for architecture within the discipline of aesthetics is crucial. Both architecture in aesthetics and aesthetics in architecture education. Architecture provides spaces and conditions for the enjoyment and experience of the world in its many manifestations. Walls, windows, doors, ceilings, passages, rooms, halls, all these architectural features offer us relations with the qualities of the world and of life. Furthermore, architectural spaces are often understood or felt as symbols of life conditions. Schiller's famous text <clears throat> on the aesthetic education of man distinguishes two kinds of education. One aiming at a career for money, the other for the development of the mind. Thus, aesthetic education, as so meaningfully explained by Schiller, is ever more important for architectural and urban design education in today's world, which has generally lost contact with meanings of life and the things that supply life with quality. But more than anything, architecture with aesthetic qualities makes us feel at home in the world. I don't know if you can see this. Thank you very much. I didn't want to speak all 45 minutes.
comments. As you heard, the title of this presentation is An Islamic Numerical Interpretation of Hagia Sophia of Constantinople. Ideas regarding aesthetical thinking and architecture developed through history a number of interpretations addressing its cultural and social importance. These interpretations appear as formations of possible worlds of meanings structured through the human power of imagination and reaching impressive, impressive levels of creative comprehension what architectural structure can reflect by its meaningful essence. The paper explores one of such possible world of meanings given in a full numerical interpretation of the architectural structure of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Beside its complex and hermeneutic nature, the analyzed document reveals a highly sophisticated level of interactions of various cultural elements. They are composed into a whole which idealistic and poetic nature seems to be based on a cosmopolitan approach to philosophy, religion, and human capability to comprehend the divine essence of creativity. It reminds us of the very nature of the intercultural nature of philosophic interpretation of architecture as a living condition of aesthetic thinking. Moreover, the document discussed in this paper shows that such a fascination with architecture is not exclusive to the contemporary aesthetic thought, but represents one of the historical fundamentals of that what social and uh, cultural communication of architecture is. Philosophical and theoretical interpretations of buildings are not an unusual occurrence in the history of architecture. Such expressions, however, often remain little more than identifying a given architectural object as an important culture or religious artifact of the epoch, and by certain means, their significance can be magnified to the symbolic level of the cosmic order and universal divine creative laws. One such building is without doubt the Church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. In this article, we will analyze a document, which is here on the screen, representing this most important building of the Byzantine epoch. The document comprises drawings of the plan, exception, axonometric exception, the four details, namely the window, the window, the capital, here, a part of decoration, and the representation of a sphere. It has been found more than 10 years ago among old books on architecture from the 19th century in Bulgaria, not as an integral part of any volume, but as a separate page. Obviously, being a hand drawing, it has been purchased separately at some time and aided to the collection of books. The drawings were proposed to produce a harmonious hall and framed with three rows of lines. A system of numbers responds to each image related to the parts of the building. Two inscriptions can be seen within the composition. One taking the central part of the drawings and presentation of, and the presentation on the ribbon and the second in the right lower corner. In the margins on the left part of the document, by, but outside it, here, here. <coughs> there are three inscriptions in Arabic letters. In the middle section of the lower margin we see a stand library seal. The representation of the seal shows a central dome with two minarets and two stars in the photograph. The date and origin of the document are uncertain, mostly because there are religiously proposed elements in the representation of the building. 
The drawing presents Abiyya Sophia as it was built in Byzantine time without any Islamic alterations. There is a cross placed on the top of the dome in the section and axonometric presentation. The axonometric presentation of the interior emphasizes the carol in the pendentive here. As the cube placed on the spot where the Byzantine emperor stood, here, and from which the Quran has been read in Islam here. However, the Arabic inscriptions in the margins are comments related to the use of verses and terms related to the beginning of reading of Quranic chapters. They read, I quote, Regarding the pronouncement of in the name of Allah, the merciful and all compassionate, when two intend to read the Quran, it is allowed, as it is allowed for them to speak, Christ be to Allah, and the second. And he answered, this cannot be pronounced. There is a question. Is this a complete ayah or not? And is it regulated as a primal obligation from Allah most exact? And because of this perplexity, it should not be admitted in reading or handing it down. These words are testified, that also testify that they speak how Tasmir distinguished from Abusa, considering to be an integral part of the Quranic text. The end of the book. The nature of this text refers to the possibility that the pictorial representation of the Hagia Sophia within the margins and the related numerical system can be thought as an important theological discussion. The two inscriptions in the margins contribute to the uncertainty of the document's origin. They are not written according to the rules of Arabic calligraphy, this one and this one. And they are still not deciphered, although it is certain that they are not in Persian, Turkish, or Arabic. It is possible that the author of the document deliberately invented a kind of hermeneutic script hiding its origin, which is not so unusual. Moreover, the first half of the inscription in the lower right corner here repeats the characters placed on the river above the Victorian position. This fact shows the existence of a logical matrix which binds these two inscriptions, probably containing the title and the information related to the document. The Christian character of the way in which the Hagia Sophia is presented as the Quranic comments in the margins point out raise a few important issues regarding the possible origins of this drawings. If the document originated within a Christian community and from a Christian author before or after the conquest of Constantinople, certainly the comments on Quranic issues would not have originally been inscribed in the mansions. This possibility allowed that even existing Muslim alterations to the building could be neglected in the presentation, which was an ongoing practice in some Christian drawings of the Constantinople, Constantinople from the 15th century. However, in that case, the hermeneutic inscriptions accompanying the drawings could be explained as a way to protect the author's name. If so, the Quranic comments were possibly aided with the drawings that were at the time. The second possibility is related to an Islamic author who would certainly not be averse to presenting the Islamic alteration to the building of Islamic religion symbols, but only if the drawings were made after the Hagia Sophia was transformed into a mosque. As it is, there is a possibility that the document was made before the Turkish conquest, but also represented the divine dignity of the Church and respect for the magnificent importance it held for Muslims in the centuries before the conquest as Nechipovu document. That would explain the Quranic comments in which 
the structure of the building seems to be equated with the text of theological importance. By this, it is similar to the Islamic presentation named Java, which consists of geometric patterns of a core plan with numerical alterations, surrounded by the correct verses. However, we should keep in mind that the alteration of Quranic verses to an important, uh, uh, verses to an important discussion in literal or pictorial is a broad tradition in Islamic culture. It seems that one detail can help in the possible clarification of some issues we discussed. The representation of the library cell the library seal, uh, pressed on the lower horizontal margin, contains an image of a dome built of stone blocks with minarets uh, on both sides, stars placed on each side, between the dome and the minarets. There is a strong similarity in character of image, shape of dome, and presented technique of its construction, which is very important here. Between the representation of the seal on the seal and of those found in the medieval sheet pilgrimage scroll related to the shrine of Imam Hussein at Karbala. Despite its importance, the similarity cannot indicate the exact origin or the author of the representation or the time of its appearance. However, the possibility that this presentation of Hagia Sophia was part of an Islamic library or school indicated its early importance and the likelihood that it is a copy of an open document made by an Islamic author. The analysis of the numerical system used in the document and its relation to the drawings indicates two kinds of use of numbers. The first one serves to show the number of windows in the dome. Here, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Presented in the section of the building, the number of arches related to the central section of the church, and the number of flying buttresses placed on the west facade in the axonometric drawing, as well as the number of walls over the pervis presented in the plan. However, the second numerical system, used in the document and its relation to the uh, uh, however, the second numerical system seems to be based on a philosophical approach to the ideal meaning of the interpretation of the Church of Hagia Sophia. We are driven to this conclusion not only by the particular character of the numerical system related to the parts of the architectural structure, but also by the position of the plan according to the section. The plan is longitudinal, it is, it is not correlated to the section. The plan is not positioned to correlate architecturally to the section, which indicates that we are not looking at a professional architectural plan, but a polygon for expressing particular numerical meanings. There are only five numbers used in this system. One, two, four, six, and nine. It is interesting that when they compose a compound number, they are not aided one to another to give a sum of the used numbers, but are alterated to produce a row as one, four, one, six, nine, one, or nine, one, four, six, one, two. There is a strong sense that by these means, these five numbers express a kind of process related to a particular meaning of the architecture and its significance as a creation. Further, it is important to emphasize that the possible system of expressing such ideas comes as an interpretation of a building erected a long time prior. This fact raises the possibility that the author of this document used the building of Hagia Sophia to interpret universal symbolic values related to the process of creation in general. In this way, he is also magnifying the importance of this architecture to the level of universal harmonical order, which was not unusual in the Islamic culture and philosophical tradition. 
The possibility that this numerical system was used for such a purpose indicates the way in which these five numbers appeared in the document in the first place. They are presented as a progression in the upper left corner of the plan. Here. Number one and two are placed together in the circle of Scopolia, following the horizontal line. They are accompanied, accompanied by four, six and nine, placed within the left upper corner in the square which forms the niles of the church, but following the vertical line. In the same way, these five numbers appear in the Chromatus of Geras. When presenting the geometric progression, one, two, and four in a horizontal row, and four, six, and nine in the vertical row, where four belongs to both lines of number progression. Number four relates to two as two to one, giving the ratio one to two. Add on the other side, four relates to six as six to nine, giving the ratio two to three. All to the interest of Islamic philosophers in ancient arithmetic, particularly of Nicomachus and Neopythagorean, this was known as carefully documented, as well known as carefully documented, is important for our discussion to emphasize the parts of the epistle of arithmetic written by the brethren of purity, or Ikhvan uh, al-Sakha. In the chapter 22, they emphasized the, part, uh, emphasized that the use of numbers 2, 4, 6, and 9, and they ratios forming the geometric progression where the number 1 is representing the monad the beginning and the sum of all numbers. By this, the numerical system in our document finds its support in one of the most important Islamic philosophical texts in the Islam. However, it seems that the use of these five numbers is not only the consequence of their mathematical significance. The compound number for four, but by, uh, by one, two, four, six, and nine, indicate the possibility that their symbolical meaning has also been taken into account. No rational mathematical logic can be grasped from the way in which they alter from one to another. Rather, it seems that they follow a particular connection to the architectural structure and to the cardinal directions of east and west. The found numbers seems to follow a particular metaphorical logic usually emphasized as the essence of aesthetic and spiritual appreciation of the universe and architecture as its material image. This appreciation is based on the inside capacities of the soul and its ability to comprehend the relationship between the immaterial essence of its material perfection. In the Islamic tradition, number one represents the creator, one, primordial existence of the monarch, the beginning and the sum of all other numbers and principles. Number two identifies the intellect, the active principle of creative power. Number four is the matter of artifacts, material order, the square. Number six is the first body consisting of six directions, a cube, an ideal form. Number nine is the sphere of spheres, the final number of the cycle and the symbolical end of all numbers, the sum of all beings in existence, day, completion and fulfillment. Even in the Western Middle Ages, we've encountered a strong influence of Islamic symbolical appreciation of the number nine. Magister Johannes, in his adaptation of the lost Arabic word, Work, the work of Muhammad ibn Musa states that the nine is the first number to contain a perfect number, cubic number and plane. However, the symbolical use of five named numbers in discussion 
It seems to correlate also with Islamic philosophical ideas, particularly with the description of five eternal principles of the universe, explained by Muhammad ibn Zakari al-Razi at the end of the 9th century. In this text, we read that the first eternal principle is God and his wisdom, which is perfect and pure intelligence. The second is the soul inclining to produce material force in this world. The third eternal principle of matter. The fourth is the space. And the fifth is time, which is also movement, usually circular, according to the ideas of Plato. It seems that the symbolical meanings of the numbers 1, 2, 4, 6, and 9 correlate essentially with this explanation of eternal principles. By this, we can reach the broader meaning of the particular relationship which was developed between architecture representation of Hagia Sophia as a model of universal creativity and the numerical system used to explain its essential meaning. In the further discussion, we will use the symbolical meaning related to each of the numbers in order to comprehend their own forms and their relation to the architectural structure of Hagia Sophia. As a first step in the process of clarification of the possible meaning of the used numerical system and its symbolism, we should pay attention to the rephrase representation of the sphere here. This one. Placed between the axonometric drawing and the section of the building. The drawing shows one half of two concentric ellipses, further differentiated by color where the larger external one is divided into five parts by vertical and two uh, lateral lines producing active angles. The point of their interaction, intersection with the essential ellipse is marked as one, two, three, four, and five. The smaller ellipse ends at the lines producing the active angles. What is important for our analysis is the appearance of compound numbers 291 here in the upper left section of the ellipse and 46 here in the upper right section. Inside the angles on the left side will be the number 200 and 100 on the right. The U these numbers used only in the context of this drawing also have a symbolical significance. The number 100 signifies the assembly of all things in the plan of the Creator, while the number 200 indicates the return of all things to the One, which is their principle and intelligence. Following the possible logic of the alteration of symbolic meanings of presented numbers, on the left side, we can read that by the potential of the active creative power, which is number two, and by reaching the completion of the creative process, number nine, both emerging and finishing in the absolute one, number one. All created things return to the one, which is number 200. On the right side, we press that this process can be conducted by way of originating from the order of matter, number four, and by achieving its perfect bodily appearance, number six, according to the laws by which all the things are assembled in the plan of the Creator, number 100. Inscribed in the shape of an elliptic sphere, the number meanings established this way respond perfectly to a universal idea of harmony, correlating invisible potentials and visible means of the creative powers of the cosmos. The geometric counterpart to the presented numbers perfectly reflect the ideas expressed in the Islamic philosophical tradition where the circular or spheric form of the cosmos indicates the return of the created world into the perfect realm of the Creator, while the sphere was the first and perfect manifestation of the created universe. In this context, the image of the sphere, which consists of two concentric ellipses, the larger one probably representing the heavenly realm, 
may be in uh, air or water, and a small this here of Earth can be thought as the geometric pattern of the universal harmony between the elements structuring the world. In support, in support of this idea, we should mention that in Islamic mystical doctrines, number 100 and 200 have additional meaning related to the name of Allah and their categories reflecting among them the elements of the world structure. There are different practices uh, and they are all related to the epistle of music of the Iqfan al Safa, which I mentioned already, where we read that not only the sphere of air can be identified with the number nine, but also the harmony of the universe rests particularly in the relationship between spheres of earth and air. And so on. When applied to the drawing of the building session, section, The similarity of the analyzed representation of the spherical shape of the dome and the arches on the wall of the now screen into focus. The lower zone of the wall, colored dark, darker, seems to correspond to the aspect symbolically expressed by the numbers 100 and 200. If we draw over the section the system of lines represented in the image of the sphere, a vertical axis and two lateral lines producing the same active angles will create a perfect overlap. The intersection points of the lateral lines with the section of the building will mark the horizontal line which divides the lower earthly part of the upper zone of arches, walls, and dome, as the representation of the heavenly sphere, which we know already as a symbolical matrix in each Christian church. For this, for this discussion, it is important to be emphasized that the similar geometric uh, structuration of the sphere of the dome can be seen in so-called Chahartak, a particular Islamic architectural practice. Here it is, a construction that shows that the author of our document probably used for him recognizable, widely, uh, widely circulated construction pattern play the existing dome of Hagia Sophia and the most sophisticated geometric practices of Islamic architecture. <coughs> I will just take uh, a short time now, according to all this what I have said, to read something which can explain exactly what the numbers do. Uh, so on are about. In this context, the appearance of numbers to nine inscribed near the apse here. And numbers four and six marking the position of the main entrance into the building placed in the lower zone seems to be related to the idea of pure creative potential. As the beginning and the end of the process, number two and nine, and to the expression of pure means by which the creative power operates in the visible world, the material order and the three-dimensional body, which is number four and six. There is a possibility that even the position of these numbers has been symbolically related to, core, to cardinal directions. 2 and 9 in the east and 4 and 6 in the west, marking the daily motion of the sun. The idea of the whole process of creation is reflected in the Ratio 91 to 46, inscribed in the lower right part under the section. It is a reminder that the completeness of creation, number 91, is proportionate to the use of creative means, number 46. In that sense, the ratio inscribed in the middle under the section drawing, 291, slash 461914, refers to the creative process as the whole, where the active intellect at the beginning and the completeness of the creation at the end, number 291, 
is proportionate to the idea that through the initiative of the use of material order, material order the first number four, and thereby the final shaping of the three-dimensional body, number 61, under the final structuring of the sphere, number 91, presents the material order by itself as condition of the creative power, the last number four. Not to take your time much uh, longer, I will just read one example more. These examples indicate that the process of deciphering the larger compound numbers is highly complex because there is a greater possibility of more uncertain interpretations. However, the number placed in the main dome presented in the plan of Hagia Sophia here seems to provide an opportunity for an attempt at a more accurate result. The compound number is 41691, related to the main dome in the context of the proposed system of reading of the numerical meanings can be interpreted as. When the material order has been completed, number 41, through the three-dimensional body, which is the cube, number six, the creation of the whole and the return of all things into one has been completed through the image of the sphere, number 91. The variable of the last interpretation joins six and 91 and can be read as through the accomplishment of the three-dimensional body under the sphere as the image of the visible universe. All creation returns to one. I will not take your time longer. Uh, however, it is from a crucial importance to emphasize that the nature of the representation discussed in this work is by the logic and the central understanding that makes the magnificent importance of the building of Hagia Sophia very close to literary texts, appreciating its exceptional value. For instance, in the description given by Chefer Cianetti, which follows the great Byzantine tradition, the metaphorical reconstruction of the cosmic structure captured in the building was exposed. In our document, we read almost the same significant aspects but expressed through the symbolical, numerical essence of such structure and the universal creative power behind it. It seems that there is a strong principal connection between the textually exposed metaphorical and numerical meanings. However, the applied numerical system is closer to the idea of the building as the imago mundi and to the notion of creation as the proportional hierarchy of numbers and their meanings. By this, discussed numerical expression of the Hagia Sophia was translated from its material structure into pure spiritual context of the cosmic structure, reaching the highest level of perfect cognitive leader. Thank you for this very inspiring lecture. Our, according to the program, we shall now have a half hour break. I'm sure that on the basis of these two interesting lectures, you will have many themes for the exchange of the opinions. We continue with the program at quarter past 11 with keynote speech of Professor Curtis Hart. Thank you. Due to the health problem, Professor uh, Alex Eriades did not come to Belgrade and, and will not have a plenary presentation. Uh, we are sorry for that. And also, a lecture by Professor Peter Osborne will be held at the amphitheater of the Faculty of Architecture, second floor, on the Tuesday, 23rd, from 11 a.m. Thank you. And uh, we'd like to carry on now with uh, our next keynote speaker. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Curtis Carter on the stage, 
who will in the next 45 minutes give his keynote speech with the name Cities as Ways of World Making. Professor Curtis Carter is a chair professor of aesthetics at the Department of Philosophy. He was international curator in the Beijing Museum of Contemporary Art. Professor Carter was the chair of aesthetic committee FISP of philosophy in 2018 as well as President of International Association for Aesthetics from 2010 to 2013. He was an Executive Director uh, and Secretary Treasurer for American Society for Aesthetics from 1996 to 2006. He was the President of Dance Perspectives Foundation of New York from 1988 to 1998. Professor Curtis was a founding director of Haggerty Museum of Art from 1984 to 2007. From some of his selected publications, uh, where he participated as an editor as, or as a contributor, we would mention Border Crossings, Unsettled Boundaries, Philosophy, Art, Ethics, East-West, Aesthetics in Everyday Life, uh, East-West, and Art and Social Change, International Association for Aesthetics Europe. From numerous museum exhibitions, we will mention Wilfredo Lam in North America, Milwaukee in 2007, Jean Poutier from 1898 to 1964, and Barbara Morgan prints, drawings, watercolors, photographs in 1988. He gave many international conferences and university lectures in China, Europe, and USA. He was conference organizer of Philosophy, Art, Ethics, East-West in 2011 and Art, Aesthetics and the Future of City Life East-West in 2017. Professor Carter, please take the floor. Schubing's 
grease and film dragonfly eyes, and Hudson Yards, the current city development which opens officially in New York in 2019. These will be offered as instances of world making with respect to the arts and city development. Hence, the aim here is to explore various manifestations of world making in a selection of arts related to this topic, fictive cities and the arts, and their references to the formation of actual cities will be considered. First, Tolkien and ways of world making. My interest in world making references in Tolkien began with an exhibition at the Haggerty Museum which carried the title, The Invented Worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien. As it happens, recent scholarship on Tolkien appears to be notably focused on this theme of world making. Among the recent publications on his works is a 2019 publication, Subcreating Art of World Building in J.R. Tolkien's Word uh, Express Precursors and Leg Legacies by Feeney and Honecker. Among the insights in these texts, especially relevant to our topic here, is Andrew Higgins' account of Tolkien's literary and graphic means used in his Building the Worlds of Arda, Arda which include the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. These means include the use of maps, charts, genealogies, lexicons, and grammars of invented languages. Such literary and graphic means are used both to construct the worlds and to generate the interaction and transaction between the author and the reader. At the core of his invented worlds is the assumption, quote, that language creates the reality it describes. In this respect, Tolkien holds similar views to those of Goodman who views languages entirely as constructed symbol systems. Like Goodman, Tolkien did not limit his sense of language to written texts. The Hobbit, which appeared in 1937, and The Lord of the Rings, first published in three volumes in 1954-55, both suggest immediately the theme of world-making. It is not world-making of statesmen that occupies Tolkien, Rather, it is the world making made possible through the author's imaginative constructions using words. Tolkien's literary texts cannot be fully appreciated apart from the larger philosophical issues concerning language. His childhood fascination with inventing languages eventually led him to their study. For Tolkien, language is a wholly invented enterprise constructed by a mind or set of minds and has no natural existence apart from this invention and use by the human mind or by a community of such minds. Few people are aware that Tolkien was a talented visual artist, not having had the opportunity to read his original drawings and watercolor paintings, some of which are on the screen. These works are known primarily as illustrations for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and his other texts. The illustrations thus offer further insight into the imagined worlds of cities uh, by Tolkien. For our purposes here, the question posed is, in what sense might Tolkien's literary and visual images contribute to the theme of world making in general, and perhaps also to city as a world making form? The intent thus is not to make a full blown claim or to overstate the possibility, but to use Tolkien's ventures into world making as a start for the discussion in the several media I explored here. Rather, it is to show how the city plays a role in his imaginative literary exploration. Just as it is possible for human minds to construct scientific and everyday practical worlds, it is equally feasible for them to invent fantasy or secondary worlds with their own systems of logic and alternative structures. The world of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings represents such constructions with delineations of names corresponding to players and places that reside solely within Tolkien's invented secondary worlds. 
The principal body of 30-some drawings and watercolors related to the Hobbit currently located in the collection of the Oxford University Bodleian Library. Additional preliminary sketches from the Hobbit comprise part of the Tolkien Manuscript Collection at Market University. Although Tolkien offers no full-blown characterization of the city as it might be defined by urban theorists such as Lewis Mumford in his classical study of the city and history, its origin and transformation of Prospect, 1961, Kevin Lynch is the image of the city, 1960, or Edward Glazer, Triumph of the City, 2011. Recent Tolkien scholarship has focused on the city as an important topic in the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. For example, Dominica Neat's essay, The Forest and the City, The Dichotomy of Tolkien's Star, considers the author's interest in contrasting city and forest. In this context, two wizards, Radagast with connections to the forest and nature, and Saruman identified with the city in the forces of industrialization, offers a context for viewing city life in contrast to life in the forest. Perhaps Tolkien's views of the city may have been informed in part by his earlier experiences of life in Birmingham, England, a thriving industrial city where he spent a portion of his early life at the beginning of the 20th century prior to attending Oxford University. By the early 20th century, Birmingham would have been a thriving city with a history of architectural and industrial development and with the growing of growing city problems that industrialization brought. However, these works related to the notion of cities and ways of world making. Tolkien himself grew up in a Boston area of Birmingham in the shadow of Perros Pauli and the Victorian Tower of the Bastion Waterworks, possibly sources for some of the images of the dark towers that appear in his works. Also, a part of Tolkien's childhood environment was the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, with collections that included fine art, natural history, archaeology, as well as local and industrial history. As it turns out, Tolkien favors the domain of the forest over the city. This theme is developed in Conrad O'Brien and Hines' uh, recent work, uh, Tolkien, the Forest and the City. It would be an interesting study to explore whether or to what extent Tolkien's literary or visual images of the city might have been influenced by the architecture and other aspects of his life in Birmingham. In any event, Tolkien favors life of the forest of the city. Let's return then to his views of the city as expressed in the Hobbit and Lord of Rings. With respect to population, hobbits, elves, and dwarves are among those who reside in Tolkien's literary worlds. A hobbit, the main character, is one of an imaginary people who populate the tales of Tolkien's hobbits. Seemingly, the main characters are people-like characters who give themselves the name meaning Hole Dweller. They were referred to as others as halflings, since they were half the height of normal men. The Hobbit is populated with diverse occupations, including dwarves and goblins, along with the Hobbits. These characters, whose interests are not always comfortable with one another, a theme familiar in our own culture today, were not also immune to external threats. For example, a dreaded dragon named Smog. Similarly, quarrels leading to wars among the different sectors, inaugurated conflicting interests and power struggles, the likes of which we are familiar in the world outside of fiction. The dwelling spaces in the Hobbit consist mainly of structures set in imaginary cities and landscapes in the midst of mountains and waterways. Although seemingly smaller in scale when compared to portrayal of cities depicted in the Lord of the Rings, the cities depicted in the Hobbit entertain at least some of the characteristics that demarcate the city beyond literary walls. Uh, Within the Hobbit, Tolkien assigns names to geographic locations characteristic of cities, for example, Lake Town, Dale, Esgarth, and Aberystwyth. Like 
city spaces in the non-fictional world builds from Tolkien's literary discourse and two trademarks, city gates and walls, which regulate access and security are among the marks of the city and the landscapes of the hub. Additional features of cities include great halls, called feasting and council, that serve as gathering spaces symbolizing the importance of community gathering. As the common community of Ezegarth and the Hobbit assesses the damages to the city resulting from a battle which defeated the dragon smog, we find a model for addressing urban disaster. There is, in Tolkien's narrative, an understanding of key factors the city might address in a period of reconstruction after a major disruption of city life resulting from war or natural disasters, as we might expect, providing food for the needy and care of the sick and injured are among the first steps responding to danger, disaster. Questions about leadership, debates over whether a new regime or the existing one is best suited to understand the reconstruction and attention to new plans for the future are among the considerations of the community of Isagar that are being addressed. For example, should the master retain his position, or should Var, the ancestral descendant of the king, who had used his ancestral black arrow to destroy the dragon, lead the planning for risk restoration? After looking at the ruins of their city and the resources that could be utilized, including a store of gold previously guarded by the dragon, the leaders of Ezekiel began planning a new city, more fair and larger than before. Such sentiments seem to echo some of the planning needs of cities in the modern world outside of Tolkien's domain. And of course, the question of how to fund changes in the city depend on variable resources. And here, the citizens benefited from a treasure of gold liberated from the dragon who had previously controlled it. Tolkien's fictive world of the Hobbit is not immune from the kinds of group discrimination based on differences in the world population which contaminate the world that we inhabit. For example, Bjorn, a character in the Hobbit, expresses the view that he's not overly fond of dwarfs. On the other hand, this same character, Bjorn, 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 that's a method of pronunciation, by cautioning against trusting anyone you didn't know, warmly extends hospitality and equips his visitors with food and ponies continue their journey through the Mirkwood forest and homeland. Tolkien's account of cities continues in The Lord of the Rings as the character's journey through the land. In Fellowship of the Ring, Part One, Lord of the Rings, is an account of the city of Minas Tirith as viewed from a distance by a character, Frodo, in the midst of battle. Quote, far away it seems and beautiful, whitewashed, many towers, proud and fair among its mountains, upon its mountain sea. Its battlements glittered with steel and its turrets were bright with many banners. In part three, book five, um, this same uh, city is described, quote, for the fashion of Minas, Minas Turret was that, such that it was built on seven levels, each dealt into a hill, and about each was a set wall and each had a gate wall, and each wall was a gate. Pippin gazed, one of the characters, gazed in growing wonder at this great stone city, vaster and more splendid than anything that he had ever dreamed of. In contrast to the imagined cities of Lord of the Rings is the account of the old forest. The forest is clear. Everything in it is very much more alive more aware of what is going on, so to speak. And the trees do not like strangers. They are usually content merely to watch you as long as daylight lasts and don't do much more. But at night, things can be most alarming. I thought all the trees were whispering to each other, passing news and clocks along in an unintelligible language, and the branches sway and grow without any wind. The city in Tolkien's literary schemes anticipates some of the problems of cities with their focus on the changing character of the non-fictional city. 
and the problems they must address in the face of changes due to war and natural disaster. His imaginative descriptions point to creative constructions that anticipate modern cities, but without the interactive technologies that have not yet arrived even in Tolkien's imagination. Hence, literary works of fiction, such as Tolkien's Abbot and Lord, and Lord of the Rings, command a noteworthy role in world making. They function not as literal descriptions, but as metaphorical alternative worldviews that may actually live in the experiences of those who read Tolkien's text, or view his visual images, or otherwise participate. In works of literature, Tolkien's constructed worlds are not the worlds of the physicists or of the people living on the street necessarily, but they may nevertheless inform and enrich the worlds of both. His visual arguments and literary texts are as they are found in his books. The second example is from the opera Mahagoni, or uh, world making in Mahagoni. World making can occur in musical arts as well in visual as in visual and literary arts. The opera Rise and Fall of the City of Macedonia by Kurt Weill and Bertrand Breck, first presented in the 1930s during the Nazi era in Germany, sets forth in song and drama the conditions of an imagined city from the Nile. Initially, the city of Macedonia was intended as a model city aimed at offering useful services to the residents. But this model soon degenerates as abuses of power and greed produce an environment where commodification of goods and services leads to the demise of bourgeois civilities. At times, artists see their role to challenge or critique the options necessarily available in city life. Then the city life itself may become an object for satiric critique as in Bile and Brecht's Rise and Fall. Mahagoni thus offers a critique both of the social conditions and the human vulnerabilities that may take place in the process of world making. The fictive city of Mahagoni and, and this theatrical creation is intended as a parable of a city gone awry. The extremes of life here uh, show poverty as a crime or as a punishment. The aim of the music, including jazz rhythms in the context of classical musical forms, was a way to, quote, get people involved in thinking. At the time of its introduction, Bile's musical production posed a challenge in the state of Weimar, Germany, and especially to the emerging Nazi vision of culture. Uh, making necessary the artist's exile to other places. There he collaborated in New York, for example, with Most Hart and Ira Gershman and Langston Hughes in enriching the cultural life of another city with Broadway musical successes in New York. A moment of reflection on the decadent condition of life in Vile's uh, city reminds us that our current state of city life also faces many challenges, perhaps not yet as extreme as the deteriorated conditions of Macedonia. To be sure, some of our problems, such as corruption, emerge from deficiencies in human character. But more pertinent to our concerns here are such issues as the increased commodification of city life, poverty, and the de-emphasis on the values of justice, respect, and trust, necessary to support attention to important social matters. What then will be the role of the arts in these new social processes? How will art and aesthetics fare in these changing social conditions? What new forms will the arts assemble as they emerge in the new manifestations of city life? Despite its dour lessons referencing city life in disarray, Mahagoni continues to enjoy periodic revivals in addition to U.S. productions in New Haven 
1974 and 78 at the Metropolitan Opera in 79, as well as Los Angeles 217. Its productions continue in theaters across the world. There, there it was in Bessau in 17, uh, home of the Montclair Bauhaus uh, revival, where well, uh, increasingly so is celebrated in the productions of the Mahagoni. The continuation of recurring revivals of Vile's enigmatic commentary on city life reminds us that one of the ways in which art has functioned in city life is by continuously re reviving the arts of the past through restaging and reinterpreting of past contributions. Brecht and Vile are not alone in their challenge to the narratives of life in Germany in that era. They were joined by radical artists, including the painter Otto Dix, architect Mesandero, cabaret performers, and other artists deemed Jenner in the eyes of the Third Reich leaders. The next example is a Shubing a film. Shubing is one of the leading Chinese artists of, of our day, uh, called Dragon's Black Eyes. Taking the discussion of world making to a contemporary stance in the film, his, uh, his me uh, film medium is the Chinese artist Chu Bing's Dragon Eyes, released in 2017. Among his never ending pursuit of new challenges, Dragonfly Eyes, this cameraless experimental filmmaking project, is based on a footage from some 500 surveillance cameras and on a streaming image of city life. The film ostensibly narrates a story, a simple story, centering on the lives of two characters, Bing Ting, Dragonfly, and her boyfriend, Xiao Xiao. As they navigate through a series of identity changes in contemporary Chinese city life, but it also shows the strains of everyday urban life in the 21st century. It will generate conversations and concerns over the millions of security camera, cameras that focus on nearly all aspects of contemporary urban life, whether it is in Beijing, New York, or in Belgrade. From the maintenance of street traffic and public safety to national security uses, and possibly intrusions into the privacy important to everyday life, these remain a part of our life. Dragonfly Eyes was shown in the New York Film Festival in 2017 and was included in Xu Bing's uh, Alam Center uh, art uh, exhibition in 2018. While the artist in this work seemed mainly concerned with unlocking new aspects of creating art film, no doubt this new venture of Xu Bing will heighten realization of the role that surveillance devices have assumed in our 21st century life. It will generate, hopefully, conversations and concerns over the millions of security cameras that focus on nearly all aspects of life uh, that we, as we know it, whether in, in whatever city. Apart from its creative advances to experimental filmmaking, this work vividly draws our attention to what may well be a grave threat to the values based on personal freedom as it is lived out in the 21st century and beyond. While the artist in this work is also concerned with unlocking new aspects of film, creative film, no doubt this venture will heighten realization and understanding and concern about 20th century life and surveillance. The last example is concerns an actual uh, city project with architectural dimensions. That is the Hudson Yards project, uh, which opened uh, in March of 2019 in New York. Uh, taking the discussion of ways of world making in the actual world, the world of actual cities, I'll cite briefly the contemporary city uh, for making process. Uh, looking at New York's Hudson Yards project. His contribution to world making joins other such projects, such as the 92 um, 
Baker publicly dissolved Battery Park City, completed in 2011, and Lincoln Center, completed in 1955 in New York. Both currently uh, cultural hubs of city housing and major performance art spaces for dance, theater, and music in New York. Unlike the publicly developed 92 acre Batteries Park, embodying the urban ideals of reformer Jane Jacobs, Hudson Yards consists of a privately developed 28 acre section of Manhattan. This development was located along 10th Avenue in New York over what was previously served as the 30 track Hudson Yards Railroad. The development has re reimagined the neighborhood, once dominated by rundown industrial buildings and auto repair shops, as an architectural landmark. Unlike previous urban projects in New York, such as Battery Park and Hudson, uh, it's proceeded from a single company development headed by Stephen Ross. Hudson Yards, as it now exists, thus includes a cluster of residential, commercial, retail, and cultural spaces featuring high-rise towers, containing office spaces, apartments, and extensive mall and green spaces. Taking note of increasing terrorist threats, Hudson Yards developers were mindful of security needs and ability to cope with natural disasters. It features apply the latest technology and system building, including a power system, rainwater collection, and protection of storm systems, and of course, elaborate security features. A place for the arts in Hudson Yards is invested in a project called The Shed, a $475 million art center designed by Dillard, Cepedio, and Renfro in collaboration with the Rockefeller. The aim of the planet of the shed was to create a highly flexible cultural entity with architecture that would encourage artists to break out of narrowly construed discipline-based uh, activities and connect with other disciplines, dancers with visual arts, musicians with the epic forms, aimed at reaching a greater uh, degree of the population. Not to be missed in this addition to the world, to world making is vessel. A 154 feet high vertical sculpture of connected staircases designed by Thomas Heatherwood Studios in London that has purported to challenge the Eiffel Tower in Paris. All of the elements set forth in the Hudson Park project at the moment anticipate a next stage in the world making, representing a new development concept for city planning. Such a development generates hope for improvements, enrichments in, in future city life, including benefits of the newest technologies and a museum of contemporary architecture featuring buildings designed by known architects, Gary, Calatrava, Stern, and so forth. But such projects are not without their critics. New York Times architecture critic Michael Kimmelman finds Hudson Yards lacking in a semblance of human scale. Quote, Hudson Yards glorifies a kind of surface spectacle, as if the peak of the ambition of city life was consuming luxury goods and enjoying a smooth, seductive, mindless materialism. Looking at this newest manifestation of world making from a more distant perspective, it is interesting to consider the reception of Hudson Yards from the perspective of Jane Jacobs, urban art activist and planner, who challenged the urban planning ideas of the 50s and 60s and questioned the value of tall buildings isolated from street life. Jacobs would no doubt hold a skeptical view of the volume of high-rise buildings in this setting and the limits <coughs> to adjacent limited connection to adjacent street, street uh, In defense of Hudson Yard is the view of Patricia Den Denny, director of the Center of Urban Real Estate at Columbia University. Quote, this is how urban folks chose to live, a defined neighborhood that represents their values and aspirations, set amongst others of a different identity. 
concluding section. The examples of world making with respect to cities in three different forms, literature, music, and film, and in city planning, each offer insights into the matter of world making. From Tolkien's literary text, we see references to the imagined city constructions and skeletal sketches of issues necessary to city life, including glimpses of fictive architecture as contrasted with the nature in the forest and the needs for governance and the sought outside of life based in character. In Brecht's La Mahagane, we witness the breakdown of city life, exhibiting both the frailties of human condition and hope for future reconstruction of a broken city structure. Xu Bing draws attention to the pervasive interventions of the surveillance camera in the city life in Dragon Fly Eyes. The intervention of invasive security devices in almost every aspect of human life poses a threat to personal values, such as privacy, and gives unlimited access to state and other external authorities, which might include predators. Shubin's film, while it's relying on exploratory possibilities of inventive technologies, also points to a growing societal concern over the use of those devices for intervention in personal life. In the surveillance camera, we have a contribution to world making that raises very important questions about personal liberty versus the government and other societal forces and access to personal life, privacy, and safety. Not all world-making practices and processes thus are necessarily for the good. And here is a case where the arts can contribute to the discussion of the role of such devices. Moving our discussion of world-making into the real world of city planning at Epson Yards offers an instance of city planning directly related to material, social, economic structure of city planning. In an actual city, New York, one of the great cities of the world, where the lives of countless residents and visitors uh, either benefit um, from the actions or otherwise as it shapes a new direction for the city. None of these particular examples are necessarily projected from or anticipated in the visions of world-making philosophers Husserl and Goodman. And yet, they fulfill the prophetic insights of the philosophers to <coughs> anticipate or even envision such possibilities in their claims as to how human symbolisms in the form of the arts both participate in and reflect possibilities for mindful world making. No wonder artists, poets, musicians, visual artists chose to reflect and contribute to our understanding of the world process, our process of world making. In the words of urban economist Edward Glazer in his book, Triumphs of the City, great cities are not static. They constantly change and take the world along with them. And so it is with world making as cities and the artistic lenses through which we explore them continue to provide new structures that house new ideas and new talents. Conclusion. The conclusion is yet to be decided. That will be decided by the future. Thank you very much.
He's a former professor of applied aesthetics in Faculty of Music in Belgrade. He's a member of Slovenian Society of Aesthetics. He was a president of the Society for Aesthetics of Architecture and Visual Arts Serbia. He published books in English, Impossible History, with Dubra Pajuric, in 2003 and 2006, Epistemology of Art in 2008, The Clandestine Histories of the Awful Group, The Neo-Aesthetic Theory in 2017, Diagrammatic in 2018. And finally, from this Congress on, he is a President of the International Association of Aesthetics. fantastic esthetician and really, really person who helped us to prepare this congress and everything that will happen in the next five days. He sent his regards from Ljubljana because he could come here and I really that he was in some way present through my lecture and my presentation. I try to speak about few things, not so complicated, but relatively simple, about the relations between art and aesthetics. Between the beginning of the 20th century, the first Congress of Aesthetics, and this Congress, between the opening of Bauhaus and this moment of contemporary or beyond contemporary art and such. I try to make this difference, these relations, and to show what happened in the last hundred years in short diagrams. Also, land where I'm, where I'm standing is a land of contradictions and antagonism. Land of the permanent class and human world for the life and new forms of the life. And this my speech about aesthetics and speech about art is speech about the human forms of life and way how we to work, to deal, to react, to transform circumstances of our life and our knowledge. I will start with, with art, of course. Art is my near frame. I start with the, what's happened with the art in the last, last hundred or more than hundred years. What is the difference between European integrity of knowledge and feeling in Renaissance painting, Raphael Atena School, some kind of the beginning, projection of the past and projection of the future? What's happened? in the 20th century with this integrity and universality of European concept of art. What happened with the social transformation of the art world into proposition? What happened with Kazimir Malevich's abstraction? The transformation from the representation or expression in the supremacy of the pure feeling. What happened with the Slovenian group Irving who tried to offer Nigerian brand time for a new state, something that we everybody feel in this moment. Could we find happiness there? Or traditional, now for me the most traditional art work of the 20th century, Dijan's ready-made. Dijan ready-made who transformed ontology of art work, presence of the piece in time and space. And of course, something that is connected with us. When I use the term us, I think for us to come in from the post-socialist country, this question of every day struggle for the life and presenting of our wars. I take, for example, work Ergosian, Melody Bekov, Kazakhstan artist, and he's trying to be somewhere in the space in the life and such. But what is this transformation that happened in the last hundred or more than hundred years. This transformation, I will put this some kind of proposition of ontology to strategy. From ontology, a philosophical notion, to something that is military or economical or tactical term in contemporary activist way of thinking. What is the strategy? All of these examples are specific strategy in relation to our specific context 
in contextualization and recontextualization and stuff. In that sense, my basic statement for this lecture, in some way, basic statement for this Congress is complexity and complicity must be defined. We are in a time of complexity, too many things in the same time, in different situations, in different relations, and complicity. How to speak, how to collaborate with each other, how to take responsibility for our lives. And one old Foucauldian sentence must be defended. We must defend these two positions, complexity and complicity. But I return to the aesthetics. What happened with aesthetics? How we transform philosophical aesthetics? What are the roads? What are the paths who go travel from the aesthetics toward our time? And I make this diagram with different points. For the traditional position, important points are aesthetics in traditional sense, interpretations, interpretations of spe uh, specialized sensualities, specific media production. Aesthetics is the history of the philosophy of art from Hegel to Arthur Danto. Meta-aesthetics, critic of the language and concepts of aesthetics and disciplinary terms and generally theory of art, theory to try to explain art a specific frame, specific kind of product as such. This transformation kept in these times in different directions. I make one very formal model. Model from the binary opposition, from the modern time, and multiplicity from contemporary time. Binary opposition, traditional model, Heidegger with metaphysics and philosophy, and Ludwig Wittgenstein with anti-philosophy and anti-metaphysics. In my youth, I have been Wittgensteinian. Today, I am skeptical of Wittgenstein, but I believe in this idea. But this opposition between two male philosophers mark modernist attitude. Other position, also important of this opposition, is between Theodor Adorno and critical theory and Jacques Lacan in his neo-baroque discursive interpretations of the destruction of human subject. These models you can put in many, many, many examples. I just choose these two oppositions. But it's important this idea that we have different, strong, important meta positions. If we try to speak about the contemporary times, we have something what is multiplicity, something what we call cluster in music. It is connections of different positions, different points, different discourses, different statements in this time and such. I take some people. It, on this place could be everybody in this room. On this scheme could be every person who tried to make intervention in art. I try to make difference between Alex Arievitz and his theory of avant-garde, Jacques Rancière and his politization of aesthetics, Judy Butler and question of the gender, and very important question in this time, what is the gender, what is the sex of art and aesthetics? Catherine Malibu with her reconstruction of the plasticity from Hegel tradition, Stuart Hall with ideas of the race and political new left thinking, Okvui and Rezor, African curator who made the visible new continent and new world as such. Chakravarti Spivak with the question between coloniality and feminist position. Boris Groys with his manipulation and transformation of the post-socialist ideas and positions. Vicky Ball with her nomadic theory. Somebody could say that all this theme is some kind of the nomadic model of multiplicity. But for me, it's important to say that in this moment when I speak, relation between modernist but binary oppositions and multiplicity of contemporary time is a question of my body. Thinking doesn't exist without body. Body is something that's happened and we tend to see in this multiplicity relation. And then return to the uh, aesthetic diagram. We try to see what happened with the 
philosophical, theoretical, artistic effort to go beyond the state. It's happened between late 50s and the late 80s. It's question about the theory or not. What's happened with the different theoretical discourses, different narratives who are not constructed about art, about the aesthetics, about the philosophy of art, they are coming from the philosophy, from politics, from sociology, anthropology, linguistics, and became part of artistic thinking as such. Theories beyond aesthetics, it's an idea about going out of aesthetics. When I have been a young boy, in late 60s, early 70s, I believed that aesthetics is that early, that uh, lady, that is finished story. It's story without possibilities. And in that moment we see how many people, how many people who come from different contexts try to deconstruct, to criticize, to destroy aesthetics and to find what's happened with the discourse in the middle of the artistic or cultural practice. From the other side, we got relations with feminist aesthetics and theory of gender aesthetics and theory of the gender, uh, gender and queer understanding. It's a question which asks what happened when we start to speak, not just about these big boys, but we start to speak about the possibility, who is other, who is other not in this room, who is other in myself, and my self-subjectivization and such. These ideas, if we transform from the feminist discourse to the general discourse of aesthetics, philosophy, of art, is a question of hybridization of aesthetics, we try to implement different modes of presentation of aesthetical problems. And from the last point, very important task was to decentering Eurocentric aesthetics. Eurocentric aesthetics have to find different possibilities in different and other cultures out of our frame of the knowledge. In practical sense, it means that we have different narratives and different stories. Transformation from the Kantian aesthetics to the Clement Bridget's formalist theory of the visual arts. Transformation from Laszlo Mopolinat's theory of new media, Valeria in photography and film to the optical media in Frederick Hitler theory. From Telkel revolution and relation with Chinese cultural revolution, revolution in the late 60s and art language theory of transformation of artistic education. And of course, from the result of all of critics of the artistic and art historian canon to the Jacques Rancière questions of the politics of aesthetics. All these transformations are transformations of the knowledge and they how knowledge existing in our frame of the life. If we speak about the contemporary times, we can speak about incommensurability in different relations between aesthetics and art. One of the first gestures is gesture which happened from the late 80s to the late 90s is rebooting aesthetics, reset of aesthetics. Try to find new zero position in aesthetical tradition, in philosophical tradition. Try to reconstruct theoretization about aesthetics in the frame of the multiplicity of the contemporary philosophical things. Second position is politics of aesthetics, approaching aesthetics through the various social dispositives, to see what's happened aesthetics when we speak in the frame of the visual art, music, cultural politics, cultural specific politics in different colonial, post-colonial, decolonial countries, post-socialist country, capitalist countries who are in transformation. For example, I'm part of the generation who have the experience of the transition of the socialist country in capitalist country. In that time, in the late 80s, nobody believed that also capitalist country come and start transition somewhere. And this happened now. This is a very important idea of politicization of aesthetics. Then we can speak about different aesthetic regimes, different ways how to transform our sensuality and sensibility. And if somebody asks me today, what is aesthetic for you? My answer will be aesthetic assemblage. It will mean 
some kind of complexity of different discourse. And you have this morning, you have uh, you listen for presentation, quite different presentation coming from the different cultural frame, different disciplinary ideas about the aesthetics and their transformation such. It is that complexity which we want to point. And if you return to art, we have to ask what's happening in art. Many things happen, but I choose just one, one segment. It is lecture performance. Tomorrow afternoon we have lecture performance and you can see this idea. How theory became body through the speaking or behaving of the actors, theoreticians and artists. But theory is art practice. Art practice is theory. Art between discourse, dispositive and affect perform theory as practice. These three moments are important. Discourse, how to communicate. Dispositive, where we communicate. What are the human, social, anthropological relations. And affect, what is the effect or our bodies and mind of the theoretical, aesthetical and artistic gesture. Some person I take an example. Of course, John Cage with his lectures, mesostic readings. Jean Luc Godard with his theoretical or political or polemical films, History of the Cinema. Xavier Deloitte, Deloitte, choreographer, dancer, who try to discuss through dance his theoretical and political positions. The Russian group Stodjelat, who work between socialism and liberalism, between the memories and non-memories between East and West. And Tania Brugiera from uh, Cuba who work the power of the woman. Power of the woman who try to provoke what is her body, her feelings, her ideas in front of the politics, the geographical position, historical possibilities. And then finish this discussion with one interesting model. Accidentally I found that two persons, one philosopher, philosopher who promote philosophy as philosophy, return to the Platonistic way of the thinking. Uh, he wrote manifesto for the philosophy, Alan Badiou, and from other side, sweet artist, uh, artist who work with the performance, with the intervention, participatory art, Thomas Hirschman. In one moment, both of these persons put very similar diagrams, very different. Alain Badiou put diagram in which he connect l'amour, l'art, la politique, la science. He tried to connect you, love, Luba, I speak now in more languages, art, 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 humanness, politique, politica, science, now. And this connection for his is basic platonistic unity of reconstruction and repair of the philosophy. On opposite side to him, in five different contexts of artistic practice, intervention in urban space, work with the different groups, immigrants, uh, dust writers, and different people, uh, Thomas Kirchhoff put scheme, love, aesthetics, philosophy, politics. Aesthetics, politics, philosophy, love. Love, uh, politics, philosophy, aesthetics, and all other combinations. They offer some kind of idea what is important in this moment when everything goes to hell. We try to see love, of course, philosophy, of course, politics, of course, and aesthetics as tool for all of us. Thank you very much. We concluded the morning presidential and keynote lectures. We are now inviting you to join us at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Architecture, where first the lunch will be served and afterwards we will continue the Congress following the book program. Finally, I would like to close the opening ceremony by wishing the conference every success. I hope that every one of you will have fruitful and meaningful exchanges in the next five days. Thank you very much.